uh, Aristotle is a very famous guy, and he was famous for his theory about physics, and also some mathematics and the philosophy. So after he studied the motion of the object, he has a conclusion. He said that the force is um, is the reason to maintain the motion. What does this mean? And this statement just explains that if there's no, no force, then the motion will stop. So for example, he used some experiment to confirm his theory. He said, if there's a ball on the ground, and if we give the ball a initial speed, then we just withdraw the force. Then nothing here, then the ball eventually will stop. The ball will stop. So that means if there's no force, the motion cannot be maintained and everything is going to rest. So this is a very uh, reasonable experiment to confirm Aristotle theory. He said, if there's no force, no external force or net force. So the motion is going to stop. So if we want to uh, start the motion, we have to give another force. So this conclusion makes sense. And this conclusion was written in the textbook, in many, many books, and everybody believed that, nobody challenged the theory, and uh, um, Aristotle was um, a famous guy in the physics at that time. But things changed um, and after 2000 years. There is a challenger, Galileo Galilei. He has a question about Aristotle theory. So you can check the, the year. So it's already uh, 2000 years later. So that means um, this guy found some conflicts. So he said that if the force is the reason to maintain the motion, then we need to uh, we need a force to guarantee this motion won't stop. Then he designed three experiments and he found there is a conflict. So the three experiment is, first of all, he has a slide and at the end of slide, there's a ground. And at the first experiment, he put some grass on the ground to make the surface rough. Is a rough surface. And, and he put some grass here. And he drop a ball on the top of the slide, and this ball will roll down. When the ball goes to the and the corner of the slide, it's going to change the moving direction on the grass. And then the speed will slow down, slow down, and eventually this ball stop somewhere. Use another color. The ball start from here, then accelerates, reach the maximum speed at the end of the slide, then the direction change, and on the grass, this ball stop somewhere. Suppose it stop here. Up here, then he changed the ground, replaced the grass by some wood. Second experiment, they use the same slide, the same ground, 
but on the ground, he put a wood, a wood pad, a wooden pad, or a plate. And this ball is the same ball and drop down at the same height and with a speed and reach maximum speed here, then change the direction, then it stop somewhere further. Stop somewhere further. And the third experiment, it replaces the wood by some stone, very smooth stone. This is the stone plate. And he dropped the same ball and accelerate, then change the direction at the end of slide, then stop, stop, stop. Doesn't stop. And it takes very long for this ball to stop. Very long. So what's the difference of the three? The three experiment, the only variable in the three experiment is the material, the roughness of the surface. Okay. And from the first experiment, this is the most rough. For the third one is the most smooth. And it says if this uh, ground is perfectly smooth, there is an ideal case. I do experiment, we cannot do, but we can imagine. It says if there is a very smooth surface, for example, it's made by ice or the perfect ice and no refraction, uh, no fraction, no friction. And this bore will keep moving and doesn't stop. Okay, so this is the experiment that Gary did at that time. And I have done some simulations in the math lab and I show you how does this board move. Okay, so let's change my sharing screen. Okay. So uh, I have uh, some program and I think it's, um, if you're interested to learn some coding and you can download my codes on the drive. And I just uh, write some simple program and help you understand the, uh, the physics. Here, um, I just uh, simulate the experiment from the Gilo. And you can take up that. The only thing I can change is the friction. Friction parameter I said is U here. At the beginning, I said the friction is very large. And when the ground is grass, then let's see how does the ball move and where it stop. Hold on, there's something wrong here. Um, where's, uh, yeah. Okay, let me run it again. So, this ball just dropped down um, from the top of the slide and it goes to the end. And now you can see the speed increase, then reach a maximum speed at the, at the ground. And then you can see the speed just uh, drop down and the moving speed go to small, 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 and then turn to zero. Then at the end, I draw the speed as a function of time after the stop. So you can find that uh, when the ball on the slide, the speed increase, and when the ball reaches to the, the bottom of the slide, the speed is the maximum, then the drop down. And it takes um, how much time? Let's see, 322, 322 seconds to reach the end, so to reach the zero speed. So that means after 322 seconds, um, 322 seconds, this ball uh, go to rest. Okay, this is the first experiment. Then I decrease 
see. Uh, I could decrease the friction then from one to five uh, to point five. I decrease friction. Then let's see how long does it take the bore to stop and how far and this boy is. So at the beginning, let's see the bore stop at x equal to 9.9, .9. suppose it's 10. So when x equal to 10, this ball stop. And the time to stop is 322. Okay, 322. So if I decrease the friction, let's say how far and how long for the ball to stop. So this ball drop down and the speed increase, then uh, the ground is going to deaccelerate this bore. And you can find that this bore still has a very large speed, even when the bore is larger than 10. Then the speed goes down, 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 and stop. Okay, now you can see that it takes over 400, 464 seconds to stop. And where the stop is, stop at x equal to 15. So that means if I decrease the friction on the ground, then it takes a long time further for the board to stop. So if I decrease the friction to 0.1, and let's see, that is board stop. I can use this one. Okay, let's see. If I take 2.1, then you can take a look of the velocity as a function of time. And the same velocity at the beginning reach the maximum at the end of this slide. Then the speed drop down, drop down, drop down. Then it takes more than 500 to get the half of the speed. So that means if this speed want to go to zero, it should take another 500 seconds. So this is a very long time to stop. So that means if the friction is zero, let's see what do we have if the friction is zero, and find that the speed doesn't change. So after speed reaches the maximum, it keeps the constant and the speed will go will reach to 50 and maintain the 50 and it doesn't decrease. So that means if there's no friction, this motion will keep going and never stop. So this is a conflict to the Aristotle's theory. So Aristotle said, Aristotle said, if there's no net force, the motion is going to stop. Um, the mistake Aristotle made is that he doesn't have, uh, he didn't have any idea about friction. Have a concept about friction. So if he doesn't consider the friction, then um, his theory says no net force is going to stop. So something is going to stop the motion because there's a friction. But Aristotle said, if we consider the friction, friction is also a force. If there's no friction, that means there's no force, no net force, then the motion will not change. So this is Aristotle's conclusion. The conclusion is, if there's no Net force. The motion uh, will never change. The motion doesn't change. Then everything will keep going and nothing is going to stop. Okay, do you have any questions? 
So from this experiment, um, Gallo write the, uh, wrote this theory uh, in a paper, but because everybody believed Aristotle, nobody believed Galileo. So at that time, the Italian government, uh, the, the royal, um, just uh, said that Aristotle is abstract and nobody understand and this guy at that time. So um, Galo, he then um, reward or acknowledgement, uh, acknowledged by the, the people at that time. But after several years, there is a famous guy, Newton, a British uh, physicist, and he noticed the Galileo's work and he, he thought Galileo's work makes sense. So he wrote Galileo's theory into his book. His book has a very famous name that is uh, here, the principle of nature principle. Uh, let me see the philosophy of nature principle of Mathematica. So this guy um, was a British mathematician, physicist, astronomer, and he had a lot of contributions to the physics. And he wrote many people, he summarized many people's work and wrote their theory into his book and gave a system of the mechanics and explain the, uh, the nature's motion and the, the motion, the principle by using the calculus to confirm. And he published a book called The Principle of Nature uh, let me say the, the philosophy of nature principle mathematica. And this book was um, now stored in the Lehigh University, the Lingerton Library. And you can find the, the I just happened to know Lehigh had this book uh, the first year I came here. And I also read some page of the paper and you can find the publicated, uh, the published year. The published year is here. Okay right here, the published year is M-E-C-C-X-I-V. So this is the year this book published. And do you know which year is this? This is a Roman numeral. And you can see the num uh, Roman numeral on the clock, but on the clock there are only 12 numbers. So uh, let me tell you what does this letter means. So M means 1,000, and the D is 500, right? C is 100, C is 100. So, and 500 plus 200 is 700. And we have 1,000, so that will be uh, 17. Then plus, plus here, this is 10, okay, this is 10. And how about this? And I is one and the V is five. If the bigger number behind the smaller number, then we have to use subtraction. So that will be four. Right? So that will be 10 plus four. So the year of this book published was 1714. So the year of 1714, very long ago. And this is not the first edition um, for, for this book, but Lehigh happened to have this edition. So the, the cover you can see is very old. And um, when we touch this book, we had to wear some gloves and uh, you can see. Um, another thing I noticed that this book was not written in English. Um, it was written in Latin. Latin is was an official language at that time, something like today's English. Um, so today, if you want to communicate with uh, people from other country in the United Union, the official language is English, um, not French, not the other language. But at that time in the Newton's era, and the official language in the Europe is Latin. So everybody write Latin in the academia book and they communicate in Latin. So this book was written in Latin. Okay, so Newton is uh, a very famous guy and uh, this is uh, the book and his contribution in this book. So if you are interested, 
and you can go to Limburton Library and uh, read this book. Okay. So Newton's first theory said, if there's no motion, uh, there's no force. If there is no force, then the motion doesn't change. That means the speed is constant. So if we want to change the speed, we have to uh, give some force. So this is Newton's first law. And the Newton's first law was confirmed by the Galileo's experiment. Then we have another question. What if the, first, the force is not zero? So if the force is not zero, how do we explain as the motion? How do we quantify the change of the motion and the force? Okay, then we have some experiment. Here we have the table. The table, I suppose, is very smooth. Okay, and on the end of the table, there's a pulley. Uh, pulley. And the pulley on the there is a string connected with two objects. One object I call M1, the other is M2. Okay, then uh, what we are going to um, do is to find the acceleration mm -hmm. of M1, mm -hmm. the acceleration of M1 as a function of the force on the string. Force on the string and the acceleration of M1. So how can we change the force? We can change the mass of M2 to change the force. We can change, we can adjust M2, the weight of M2. And if we want to measure the acceleration, we can measure speed. We can measure, measure the acceleration. We can measure the speed. The speed as a function of time. So if we have the curve, for example, this is time, this is speed, and the curve look like this. Then we can measure the slope. The slope is the acceleration. So this is how we measure this, the acceleration. So when we have the acceleration and we, can, we have the, the weight, and not with, we have the force on the string. Then we plot some scattery points on the graph. We have the force on the string to push the M1 and we measure the acceleration of the M1. Then we get some point. We get some point. And if we trace this point, we will get a linear line. So from the experiment, we get a relation that is the acceleration is proportional to the F, to the force. Okay, we can still do another experiment by find the relation between the acceleration of M1 and the mass of M1. So we can change the M, we change the mass. Mass. And we keep the force as a constant. Then we find that if the mass increase, the acceleration will drop down here. 
this is experiment data. And if we trace that, we find that this is not a linear curve. So if this is not a linear curve, it's very hard for us to find the real relation. But we find that if we inverse the mass, we get one over M and we trace the acceleration as a function of one over M, we find that this is another linear line. So that means from the experiment, we get another relation that is acceleration, the proportional to the one over M. Okay, this are the experiment we've done. Then from the experiment to the theory, we need to develop a relation between the math acceleration and the force. So we have the force and the acceleration is linear proportional. Hold on. Acceleration is linear proportional to the force. Acceleration is linear proportional to the one over M. So there are two relation and to convert the relations into the equations, we can write in this way the A equal to a constant multiplied by the force divided by the math. Okay, so now we have the equation. What's the value of K? At, that, at Newton's um, area and in that time, people already know the acceleration and acceleration was a well-defined parameter. At that time, they have the unit that is inch per second square. Yeah, that's a Newton use in unit. And for the mass, Newton also has the unit, that's a pound. Right? So those two uh, units are well-defined, but the force doesn't have unit doesn't have a defined unit, defined unit. So we can define the force, uh, the unit of force, by change the, the value of K. We can change the value of K, value of K, to find a convenient number, an easy number, find an easy number. then that is the number um, to define the unit of the force. Okay, so nowadays we use meter, second, and a kilogram as a standard unit. So we define the unit of force here. So A, we use the unit meter, per second square mass, we use kilogram. This is a standard unit. And if we use these two units, then we let set k equal to zero, or k equal to one. Then we define the unit of force. The force is k times m here, we define the unit of the force is Newton. One Newton, to give credit to the Newton. Newton equal to one meter per second square multiplied by one kilogram. So that means Newton is defined as meter kilogram per second square. Okay, this is the definition of the unit of force. Unit of force. Okay. Uh, uh, do you have any question? If there's no other question, let me move on to the Newton's third law. Okay. 
Newton's third law is uh, not difficult to understand. That means if we have two box collide, this box moving this way, and another box moving in the opposite way, okay, these two box eventually collide. And there's a collision, boom. If they collide, then this two box is going to push the other um, by giving a constant force. So here on the left side, this box is given to generate a force to the right one. Let me go here. This is a left box. And this is right box. And let's see, the left box is going to push the right box to the right. So there's a push force from left to right. And on the left box, the right box is going to push the left box. So the direction goes to the right. We have a force from right to left. And Newton's third law said, these two force had the same strength. That means the force from right to left and the magnitude equals to the magnitude of the force from left to right. This is Newton's third law set. And the direction are opposite. Direction are opposite. Okay, so this is a Newton's third law. If we write this equation into a vector format, we will have the force arrow from right to left equal to the minus the opposite force of the force from left to right. Okay, so this is the Newton's third law. Recall one of the force is active force, the other is reactive force. So if you give a force and the reaction will give you the opposite force, these two forces have the same magnitude, but on a different direction. Okay, this is Newton's third law. Okay, so I've already uh, introduced all the theories for the Newton theory, and then I'm going to move to the um, homework. So the homework um, here is we have three force on an SUV. And we know the magnitude of the SUV of each force. And we know the angle between the force and the axis. Then the question is find out the X components and the Y component for each three proofs. So let's see. And for the first one, I labeled F1, F2, F3. Okay. To find the X component of F1, we just need to separate the force into X direction and Y direction. Right? Use parallelogram row, and then we can find that the F1 X component is F1 times cosine 31 degrees. The Y will be F1 Y component equals F1 times sine 31 degrees. This is the first pair. The second pair, we have F2 X, F2 Y component. Let's see, for the second one, we have X component go to negative. So we need an, a minus sign in front of the component and the Y component goes up, that's so positive. So the second one will be F2 times, let me see, this side will be sine, right? Sine 
32 degree, and y component f2 cosine 32 degree. And the third one, f3, f3, y, let's see, the f3, x, y, x is negative, y is also negative, so we need to use negative sign, oh, I forgot negative sign here, negative sign, f3 times, let's see, cosine, 53 degree, minus F3 sine 53 degree. Okay. So, and this is the formula. And let me copy the solution. So the first one, let me write into a column vector, the bracket. So F1 will be, uh, you have two components. First one, X component is A44, Y component is 507. Unit is Newton. Then the second one, X component is minus 418. And the Y component is 668A, Newton. Third one uh, is X component two minus 247, and the Y component is minus 328. Okay. So there are X component and Y component for each three force. And the part B is use the components to find the magnitude and the direction of the resultants of three pools. And to find the results of the addition, we just follow the uh, vector's addition. The addition of the vector is using the addition of the X component and the addition of the Y component. So the addition, the total force, the net force okay, will be two, uh, two components. The X component will be the sum of X component, A44 minus 418 minus 247. Y component will be 507 plus 668 minus 328 Newton. Then the calculation give us X component is very small, 179. Y component is a large A49, no, 47, sorry, 47, Newton, okay. So the question is, what's the magnitude and direction? The magnitude will be square root, total magnitude will be square root, X component square plus Y component square, 179 square, a47 square. That will be uh, A86 Newton. The direction, let's see. The X component is 179, 179. Y component is A47, A47. So the force director vector is this one. So we're looking for this angle, this angle. This angle will be, let me see, tangent angle will be the Y component over the X component. We have A47 over 179. So we can solve the angle is around 78 degree. Okay, any other question? If there's no other question, let me give you the last question. This is a uh, homework uh, of different weights at different planet. So it says this object has a weight of 17.5 Newton on earth, but on the moon, the weight 
decreased to 3.24 Newton. Then the question is what's acceleration on the move and what's the mass? Um, here, the question is why the weight are different? The weight are different because the surface acceleration, the gravity acceleration, and um, on the earth and on the moon are different. Right? If this is earth, you see the surface of the moon. And we have the same object. This object will be attracted by the planet. And this force is called the weight. The attraction is called the gravity. And here, the weight is a force. According to Newton's second law, the weight, the weight, the force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. For the acceleration created by the, the gravity is called gravitational acceleration. We have another letter to represent it. On Earth, the weight equal to the mass on the Earth times the 9.8 meter per second squared. That's a, a acceleration due to gravity on the Earth. And the weight on the moon is also applied for the same equation, the same mass, but with different acceleration. So on the Earth, we know the weight is 17.5 Newton. On the moon, it's 324 Newton. So to find out the acceleration on the moon, we just need to over these two equations. So we use the first equation, equation one over the second equation. So we have 7.5 over 324. Then the mass canceled. We have the G over A. G is 9.8 meter per second square. Then we have the A could be um, solved. That's around 1.78, I think. I don't remember wrong. So, um, yeah, 1.8 here. So that's acceleration on the move. And next question is, what's the mass of the pack? And the mass, they share the same mass. So the mass of the pack on the moon is the mass of the pack on the Earth. Okay. So we use the weight on the Earth, on the Earth, over the acceleration on the Earth. So that will be uh, 7.5 Newton over 9.8 meter per second square. Then we get the 179 kilograms. Okay, this is the explanation for this question. So you can find that on the moon and on the earth, um, the difference of the weight are different. So there is a huge difference between the acceleration on the moon and acceleration on the earth. And that means if on the earth, you can jump. For example, if you can jump on the earth, earth and jump and you will jump and the fall here. For example, if you are, um, you are very strong and you can have two meter or three meter far away for every jump. And on the, on the move, because the acceleration is weak, so you can jump further. So on the move, it's same that you can fly, fly away. And you can jump here. Usually you can jump by a factor of six because you can check that this uh, 9.8 over 1.8 is around six. It is 
a factor of six. So that means uh, if you can jump two meters on Earth, on the, on the moon, you can jump 12 meters. Okay. So uh, this is what I want to talk today. Do you have other questions?